neonatal examination or any kind of examination you do in the exam, you may need to explain this to either parents or a medical student or examiner. Depending on who you are explaining to, you may need to customize your approach. When you are explaining to parents, your main purpose is to explain to them if the examination involves any kind of discomfort and the exposure required so that they can decide whether or not they would be comfortable with your examination and they would give the consent for that. When you are explaining this to medical student or examiner, you're trying to show your understanding of the different body systems, different regional anatomies, and the importance, clinical importance of different signs that you'll be eliciting during the examination. When you talk to parents, you have to simplify the language. When you talk to medical student or examiner, you can use medical jargons. Then the routine steps of examination, not just for neonatal examination, is we always start by first making sure that our patient is stable enough to proceed through their entire steps of the examination and they do not have any discomfort. You wash your hands, you introduce yourself, you tell the patient about position and procedure. You can also ask them if they have any pain and take care of that first or avoid checking that part in the beginning or come to that part at the end. You need to explain to about the exposure, you need to take the consent and stability. Again, one more time. But in case of neonatal examination, some of these things will not be relevant. For example, they will not give us the case where we need to start with the stability in the neonatal examination. It will be a routine examination case. Or talking about the rest of these steps, like washing the hands is still important. Introducing yourself to the patient is still impo important. But the most important part is this. Explaining the procedure to the patients or the parents and talking about the exposure required. Anytime you are doing any kind of examination on children, you need to explain to the parents what kind of exposure is required, how you will be doing the examination. So you need to explain to them that you'll be touching, you'll be doing certain procedures, you'll be making some movements, you'll asking them to make some movements in case of older children and so on. In case of smaller children, mostly the parents are concerned about the exposure because the small babies, they have the risk of hypothermia if you expose them for too long. So they, that will be their main concern. So you need to tell them about you'll be doing the examination as quickly as possible and you will cover the baby after the examination is done and we'll keep them warm. So that would be one thing that you'll be adding before you start. Then regarding the consent, if you're talking to the medical student, this is where you show to the medical student your understanding of the medical legal aspects of practicing in Australia. So what you tell them is, in case of consent, what you have to do is you have to get the consent from the parents and you also need to tell them that Parents will act as the chaperone in case of examination of children or even in case of neonates. So because anytime you are doing the examination of children, you need to offer chaperone. And th in those cases, the chaperone will be the parents themselves. So this is something you'll verbalize to the medical student. And in a way, you are telling your examiner as well that you are aware of this important concept. So this is just the basic part. But the actual examination, how do we do it? Let's talk about that. Your actual examination starts first by checking the general appearance. No matter which examination you are doing, whether you are doing it for the children or you are doing it for the adults or you are doing it for the neonates, you always start your examination with the general appearance, as you already know. In the general appearance of the neonates, what are the things you are focusing on? Basically, the things that you are focusing on are related to the APGAR score that we already know about, but we are not actually assessing the APGAR score. We are using that mnemonics to actually remember the things that we'll mention. So in APGAR score, you know that you will be looking at baby's appearance, you will be checking baby's pulse, grimaces, activities, respiratory effort, and so on. So these are the things you will be including in the general appearance. So when you are communicating to the medical student, these are the things you can mention. By the way, I forgot to mention you one thing. It's always a good idea to, if it's a it's if it's a task where you are explaining to the medical student, it's always a good idea first to ask the medical student if there is anything specific they want to know. I didn't go through those small details because I have talked about these things a lot on my videos before as well. But usually what I tend to do or what I did was before starting every examination, I would tell the medical student that, so we'll be doing the examination of the new unit today. And our main purpose of this examination is to identify if there are any congenital problems or to see the developmental features of the baby in neonates, which become apparent at the time of birth. If there are any specific aspects of this examination you want me to elaborate, please let me know. That's how I would start. And this I do not just for these neonate cases. I would do this for any case. Let's say that the case is a shortness of breath where I'm doing the examination. I would say the same thing. That today's purpose is this. So when you are talking about the purpose, basically you are talking about the clinical signs based on the differential diagnosis list. So tell them what is the purpose of your examination.
and ask them if there is anything specific they want you to elaborate. This way, what happens is you know what are the key points of the examination they want to include. They may share that information with you. They may not share that information with you. But my exam experience, which I have shared many times, is when I had asked this question to the medical student in compartment syndrome case, they told me that they wanted to know about the different compartments of the leg. So then I understood that, okay, in compartment syndrome question, talking about the anatomical compartments of the leg and their content is one of the key key questions or one of the key points. And this you can do in any examination. So if you if you start your examination like this, I think you'll be able to identify the key points if they share. If they don't share, it's fine. It's just the way we can start. Now, coming back to the general appearance, what are the things we look at? We look at the appearance of the baby. And when we are checking the appearance of the baby, we are looking for if they have any pallor, if they are any have any sinuses, and if they have any mottling. So mottling is like the lacy like kind of thing. If you do not know what mottling is, perhaps you can just look up on the internet. It is usually seen in babies who, who whose oxygenation is not adequate and can also be seen in some congenital problems. For example, cutaneous marmorata, which is not a very common condition. You don't need to tell when you see it, but you will just tell them that I'll be checking for their if they have any pallor, any sinuses, any mottling, and their respiratory efforts. So regarding the respiratory system, you will check if the baby has any respiratory difficulties or making respiratory efforts, or if they have any added sound, like any kind of gurgling sound, any kind of wheezing, any kind of strider. So appearance, you will start by commenting on this. So I will start the examination of the baby first, checking their appearance, looking for any pallor, any sinuses, any mottling, noting their respiratory effort, any, any additional respiratory sound they are making. Then after this, I will start my head-to-toe -to -toe examination of the baby, spatially checking. And this is the word I use in most of the examination cases, especially checking for the anatomical integrity and functional status of the child, functional status of different systems of the child or of the neonate. These two terms I use in all kinds of examination, not just in new, newborn examination. If I'm doing DBT examination, I'll say the same thing, that I would start my examination by checking the anatomical integrity and functional status of the legs. I will, check, I will start my examination by checking the anatomical integrity and functional status of the cardiovascular system. So this way, what it does is it tells the examiner that it builds a good structure to tell the examiner that your examination will involve checking the anatomical components as well as asking them to do certain functional things so that you can see if those reasons, those anatomical organs are working properly or not. So this is just a good way to frame your start. After this, the next part is the head to toe examination that we do in these babies. Now, different people start in different ways. Some start from the hands and then go to the head and then go to the neck. Some start from the head, then go to the neck and then go to the arms. Whatever way you do, as long as you don't miss the important points, it doesn't really matter. But you have to be systemic and it needs to look fluid that you're going from one part to another part. So in the head, what are the things you'll mention? So you will check the head of the baby to look for any deformities for example what are the defor deformities we expect we have something called caput succedaneum and maybe you remember from step one what it is caput succedaneum then we have cephal hematoma you can check for any signs of injuries if it is an instrumental delivery because unlike the face-to-face -face exam here you are just telling the things you can just I mentioned the hypothetical condition and talk about those things as well, that I will be checking for any signs of injuries in case it is an instrumental delivery. I'll check for craniosynostosis or you can just say that premature fusion of the, I'll check for craniosynostosis. Then you go to the eyes. In the eyes, what do you want to see? What do you want to check? You will check for the red reflex. You can check for the strabismus, any abnormal movement of the eyes like nystagmus. You can look for the color. So you can check if there is any ictiris. So this is for the eyes. Then you go to the mouth and then you start talking about what you expect to check in the mouth. Same thing. You, you will check central sinuses, cleft palate and cleft lip. So cleft lip, cleft palate. So you'll be checking inside baby's mouth with the globed finger to feel if there is any cleft lip, any cleft palate. You check if there is any cleft lip. You will check if there is any bifida. You can elicit the rooting reflex where you stroke the cheek of the baby and you will see the baby turn into that side. You will check for the sucking reflex where you put a glove finger, maybe your little finger inside baby's mouth and then baby starts sucking. You will check that these are the reflexes which will be present from the birth of the baby. Now, once you have finished one reason, a good way to engage the medical student in the exam is after you have finished this much, just stop now and ask them, have I made myself clear? 
Is there anything you would like me to explain further before you move on to the next part? Most often what I see is because in the last few months, I have been helping people through these one-to-one sessions. What I tend to see is people spend so much time to cover everything that they forget that this is this is an exercise where you are supposed to ask the medical student about their understanding as well. And it's not just for the understanding. Actually, it's an opportunity for you to find out if there is anything that they want you to explain further. Generally, if you are speaking, they will not interrupt you unless you stop and ask them if there is anything you want them you want them to know you want them to ask you for example in one of the cases when i was just going through the cvs examination when i reached the neck i stopped there i should have stopped earlier but i just realized that i was just talking for too long so i stopped and i asked is there anything you want me to explain and the lady who was pretending to be the medical student she asked me can you tell me how to take the blood pressure can you explain that more and i realized that okay that means they need more details on the blood pressure so so i started explaining about the blood pressure after that so anyway that the point is you need to have a physical cue or some something to tell you that okay it's time for me to stop and ask the question otherwise when you are under the pressure of time you'll keep speaking and you'll forget these small things and you may feel like you have done quite well but the result will not be as you expected so this is something for you to remember that you finish one reason stop ask the question anything you want me to ask anything you want me to explain they say, okay, I'm all right, then move forward. So, uh, doctor, did you ask, explain then and there uh, where you were doing the neck examination and then rest of the examination you continue after that? Yes. So I okay. stopped after the neck uh, because at that time I realized that I had not asked the medical student anything until then. Because in the exam, this is very, very, very common scenario that you forget these things. You are under the pressure to finish everything in time. So because of that fear, you keep talking and you forget that you have not asked any question. And they will let you speak. They will just keep nodding their head. They will let you speak. They will not interrupt. The only problem is maybe in the end, when you will get the outcome, the outcome will not be what you expected. So if at any point they say, okay, can you tell me this? You go back, you talk about that, and you come back to the point from where you had started talking about that particular particular extra information. So idea is you can do it in any way you want. But for me, what I felt was if I make a habit of you know stopping in one reason and then go to the next after asking the question, then I will not forget it. That's why I had planned in that way. Although in the exam, I forgot. And then later on, I did it anyway. But yeah, that's the idea. So, sorry, did you do face-to-face -face or online? Exam? Online. Mm, okay, thank you. Face-to-face, -face, it's going to be diff different because in face-to-face -face exam, you have to be economical with your time as well. So you can't keep talking about things you don't see. Online is different. It's It's not about what you see. Because you will not be seeing anything. You are hypothetically generating a scenario and then you are explaining this to the medical student. That is the reason why earlier I told you that if it's an instrumental deliveries, I will be checking if there, if there are any signs of injuries because I'm not sure what I need to explain. There is not a patient there. So I'm imagining the different possible scenarios and I'm talking about all of them as much as possible. And the other problem will be how much do I need to explain? That is another thing because in face-to-face -face you are performing. So there is no need for you to explain things unless you are specifically asked. Online, you have to decide how much you want to explain yourself. So for that, how do you know whether this point needs to be explained or not? Sometimes some of the things are quite basic, like taking pulse. Should I explain how to take pulse? Because if I start doing that, I'll not be able to finish things in time. So the idea was, the idea that I came up with was after every, you know, maybe after every station, I mean, station in the sense that every anatomical reason, I would stop and ask them, like, is, is there anything you want me to explain? Anything you want me to explain in detail? That's why before I started, I asked them, is there anything specifically you want me to elaborate into this discussion? And then I also started asking them after every maybe one or two minutes. And to remember it, to do it, I decided that, okay, after every reason, I will ask them if they have any questions. Okay. Sorry, but, but this will take time from the... Yes, it will yeah. take time. Will you finish the case this way? I never like, had example, problem with my time question. management. I never had problem with my time management. Okay, thank you. If you try to explain everything, then definitely it will not be possible. If you are mentioning the important points only, and then you are asking the student if there is anything they want you to explain, there will never be time problem. You will only be explaining the things they will ask you to explain. Otherwise, you will just be going through the things. So in case of ear, what are the things that you will mention? Maybe microtia, which is the small ear, any ear tags, any abnormalities of external ear, because you know that abnormalities are often associated with the other congenital problems. So you can mention that. And if possible, you can do autoscopy, but I don't think it's that much important to do it in neonate at this stage. You perhaps can do it later. In the nose, 
you can at least check the patency and then at this point that you will also try to check if there are any general dysmorphic features while doing this examination so i could have mentioned these things when talking about eyes when talking about nose when talking about lips but i felt that if i start doing that then it will be a little bit too much in every every part so what i decided was i would add the general dysmorphic features after finishing everything in the head region and include some of the common features of some of the conditions for example some of the conditions of the down syndrome like upward slanting eyes what you want to mention here is up to you but mention something like i will then i will check if there are any obvious dysmorphic features in the new unit such as upward slanting eyes or flat nasal breeze or absent philtrum, which we see in case of children born to mother consuming alcohol. So absent philtrum, or you can even say epicanthal folds. I mean, it's up to you what you want to add here because it just give just tell them that you are now looking for if there are any general dysmorphic features, which obviously stand out and some of them are and mentioned one, two or three. You will not have time to talk about all of them because there are so many of them. There are so many conditions where you will see these typical features but the idea is just to tell them that you will be mindful of checking for them as well then after finishing the head reason you go to the neck and what do you want to check in the neck again similar things you can check if there are any neck swelling and you will say that i'll check if there is any neck swellings or lumps if there are any then i'll try to find out i will try to see if there is they are in the midline or in on the side because you know that that changes your diagnosis I'll check for any congenital masses such as thyroglossal cyst or any branchial cyst. So what you are saying is I will check, then I will check the neck region to see if there are any kind of swellings or lumps. I will try to note their position. I'm trying to find out if they have any obvious congenital abnormalities in the neck region such as thyroglossal cyst or branchial cyst. So you are telling what you are doing and you are also telling why you are doing that. That way, that's what they will tell you in the stem as well, that you have to give the underlying reason for your your examination or you have to talk about the anatomical landmarks as well. So that's why you mention things like in the midline and the center, in the side, things like this. And then you go to the chest. In the chest, in new nerves, what are the things you are looking for? Again, you are looking for the signs of some of the, some of the congenital condition. For example, widely spaced nipples. You can check for gynecomastia and gynecomastia in new nerves is usually not an abnormality. It can be present in normal cases as well. You can check for the chest deformity such as pectus excavatum or carinatum. Again, what you do here is, these are the details, but you start by saying that, then I will ch examine the chest reason, looking for any abnormalities of the chest, for example, widely spaced nipples, gynecomastia, pectus excavatum, and pectus carinatum. So you are giving the overview first, and then you are giving the reason why you are checking that reason and what you are expecting in that reason. Now, as I told you that some people like to go in this way and then go to the arm. Some people start from the arm, go to the head and then go to neck and chest. It's up to you. In my case, I go up to chest and then I talk about the arms. So in arms, what are what you want to see? Of course, you want to see where the position of the arms are because you know that there are cases, uh, there are cases like Klumke's paralysis or herbs paralysis. So for that, you will check the position of the arm, whether it is rotated or not. But you don't need to go into the details of how the arm is. You will say that I'll check the position of the arm. I'll check if there is any clawing of the fingers. I'll check the hands. And on the hands, I'll check the palmer crease. If it is single palmer crease or double palmer crease, I'll count the number of fingers to check for polydactyly. I'll also check if there is an effusion of the fingers or syndactyly. So in the arm, what are you doing? So I will check the arm after checking the chest to see if there are any other deformities I can note in the arm, such as any abnormal positioning of the arms seen in different paralytic conditions, a clawing of the fingers. I'll check the hand for palmer crease, the number of palmer crease. I'll count the number of fingers. I'll see if there are any fused fingers or syndactyly. I'll also check their neck. And when I'm check, uh, sorry, nail, when I'm checking their nail, I'll check the capillary refill time to note the, the perfusion i'll check if there is any sinuses if i note any sinuses i'll try to i'll try to find the limit of the sinuses i'll try to find the extent of the sinuses and then i'll check the pulse while checking the pulse i'll check its rate rhythm character and asymmetry now after this explain what do you mean by this asymmetry to know if there is any radio radial delay or radio femoral delay which means you'll be checking the other hand and you'll also be checking the femoral pulse so because online exam is more about how you say the sentence, not just what you say. That's why, you know, framing the sentences beforehand will help you a lot. 
if you think that if you plan in this way that you become familiar with the components and you decide that okay i will do, i will do it in the exam it's going to be very difficult you'll struggle with your time management so you have to anticipate what may be coming in the exam what you may have to do and then you start framing not just the content but also the sentences or in other words you have to practice to the level of words you need to decide what words are you going to use to say things what sentence will you use that way only you will be able to finish things in time otherwise it will be a big struggle in the exam as you will you will struggle thinking about what sentence to say after this and because this is not our first language this can be a big problem that can have impact on our overall performance as well so especially sorry, for the, yes yeah sorry one question hi thank you so much first of all and second i just wanted to know i'm confused a little bit about the physical examination when you explain because mm-hmm. practically speaking if you have a, like an in person exam right mm-hmm. uh, you do the examination based on inspection you know palpation you know what mm-hmm. i mean passive movement active movement but you don't follow you just mentioned this is a like a you know what i mean generally speaking in physical examination you just mention what you look for is that enough so the question like is you, you say- You say the findings, for example, I'm looking for cyanosis, I'm looking for any abnormality, deformity. You know what I mean? Is it okay just to mention that? Or in any examination that you do, you mentioned that the purpose of, you mentioned the sentence which was quite helpful. Like you mentioned that, you know, this is a purpose of the examination, for example, is to find this, 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 all right? So oh, or yeah. di- like differentiate between this and this. So that gives you general clue. But you say that at the beginning, I assume, not in mm. every single examination, right? And then my question, my first question basically was that, do we have to follow certain order or we just mentioned what we look for? We are going in a certain order here as we are going from head to toe. That is the uh-huh. first first answer. The second yes. is, do I need to explain about everything I do? Depends on what examination you are doing. For example, if I'm doing a, a case where my examination is only for the abdomen, then in that case, mm-hmm. I have more time. So I have more time to explain everything. In fact, I will also talk about how I will position the patient or which quadrants I'll be checking or what I I'm expecting. That. But yeah, if, yeah, got it. if it is neonatal examination, they have given me eight minutes. In the beginning, I will spend one minute explaining to the medical student what I will, what the steps I'll go through. And then mm-hmm. after that, I'll start the examination, right? So roughly I will have around six minutes to finish that part. And then at the end, I'll do the closer as well. One thing that right. I have seen is most people don't do the closer. They just finish the examination and that's it. Or they run out of time, which is not a good mm-hmm. way. It's not a structure. Mm-hmm. So now you mm-hmm. can imagine if I have six minutes and if I have to explain the mm-hmm. uh, small steps as well, then it will mm-hmm. not be possible. So examination, right. Correct. Yeah. So it changes. Sometimes, you know, if you look at the previous questions, what you'll find is in some of the questions, the tasks given to you are not that many. So you know that there is a lot of time for me there. You can make your mm-hmm. mind that, okay, I'm going to explain these parts because in the first mm-hmm. two minutes, you can make this decision. In some mm-hmm. cases, it's so vague. They just tell you that this is your case. Now do the examination. Now you it feels, it feels a bit difficult to decide mm-hmm. what to include mm-hmm. and what to la- leave out. So the better mm-hmm. approach is try to include as many headings as possible, and but pause every now and then and then ask, mm-hmm. is there anything you want me to explain? If they say that, okay, let's say that, let's say that I'm doing a case of, uh, let's say uh, someone presenting with the chronic liver disease Mm -hmm. and i'm doing let's say that i have mentioned i will do the cardiovascular quick cardiovascular examination listening for the heart sound s1 and s2 any additional Mm -hmm. sounds or murmurs and gallop rhythms let's say i have Mm -hmm. just mentioned this in Mm -hmm. uh, liver case it's fine but let's say the same case has come as a case of let's say hypertension or heart failure or acute rheumatic fever I will not do mm-hmm. that. I'll explain it because it's the main focus of the examination is the cardiovascular it's system. Hard. Yeah, correct. Yeah, got it. You have to tailor basically based on the case and how much you want to go through the Yes, well, anyway. yes. So, thanks re- so much. Now, this is not an answer to your question, but just a general advice mm-hmm. that when you are practicing the physical examination cases, first learn everything about every systems and every reasons and then mm-hmm. look at the previous questions and try to decide yourself which systems I'll focus on and what are the signs I'm trying to find when you're mm-hmm. practicing. This way you'll mm-hmm. be able to customize your approach quickly in the exam. Correct. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on with the abdominal examination now. In the abdomen, we are checking for scaphoid. Or we are looking at the shape of the abdomen. It's better to say that. We are looking for the shape of the abdomen to see if there are any, again, any gross abnormalities or lumps that we can see. We are looking for scaphoid abdomen or looking for the health of the umbilical stump 
because that will be another thing you will see there. We are looking for any hernia, especially umbilical hernia, and you will do the palpation of the abdomen to check for any organomegaly. And you, if you want to specify, you can say, I'm checking for any hepatomegaly or splenomegaly. You can also check if there are any visible peristalsis. This becomes more important in cases of children who are persistently vomiting. Because as I said that, this examination can be the examination of the six weeks, could be the examination of the newborn just after the birth, just after the delivery, maybe after some time in the hospital, because it keeps changing. So you have to decide what would be relevant for that. But these are the common things to include. Gastroschisis, for example, Mentioning gastroschisis will be more important for someone who, who had just delivered the baby. I mean, the baby which has just been delivered, then when they are coming for the six weeks examination, because by six weeks, of course, if there is gastroschisis, it will not just be there or it will not be something you will be looking for. So these, these are the points to remember, but what to include will depend on when, what case you get and the age of the baby as well. So that decision you'll make based on that. After the abdomen, the next part is hip examination. So in the hip examination, again, first you are looking at the hip to see if there is any asymmetry of the skin fold of the gluteal region. So you will check the symmetry of the gluteal region. And then after that, you check the apparent leg length. And then after that, you do those two famous tests, Barlow test and Otolani test. If you want, you can, you can ask the medical student here if they know about the Barlow and Otolani test. Now, the reason I'm saying this is before explaining bar, what is Barlow test and what is Otolani test, it's a good idea to just ask them, do you know about this test? And if they say yes, then you can move on. If no, you can just quickly mention that Barlow is when you like when you you call, do the adduction of the flexed hips and push backwards to dislocate. So Barlow is push out and Otolani is push in. So that's what you quickly tell to the medical student. Or you can simply say that in Barlow's test, we are trying to dislocate the hip and in autolining, we are trying to relocate the hip to check for the developmental dysplasia of the hip. So after hip, the next reason will be genitalia. And genitalia depends on the sex of the baby, but if it's not mentioned, if it is not told to you, if the, the question is only that you need to do the neonatal examination, you can simply talk about what you are doing for the boys, what you are doing for the girls. Otherwise, you can only mention based on the sex of the baby given to you. So in case of boys, what are the things you will check? You will check for the testis, undistis, undescended testis. You will check for epipedias or hyperspedias, the opening of the meatus. So you can use the term like this, or you can just mention, I'll be checking for the opening of the urethral meatus and its location. In case of girls, you will you are checking for any labial fusion, any ambiguous genitalia. This is more important in case of girls because this is associated with the CHL. CAH, sorry, ambiguous genitalia and then clitoromegaly. So that would be the genitalia. Then you go to the leg part. Now, by now, you may have already realized that the reason I'm not explaining much on every, every step is because there are so many things to cover. And if I start explaining any of them, and if let's say that that's not what they want to want me to focus on, I will perhaps miss the opportunity. So that's why I'm trying to finish the whole thing as quickly as possible. But be mindful of their input. If at any time they interrupt you or if they any time they ask you questions, you need to explain that. In the leg, what are you going to do? You are first going to check the tone. Again, you will count the toes. You will check the spaces between the first and the second toe. Why you want to do that? Because there will be increased space in children with downs, space between first and second toes. And this time we have a reflex here. So we'll also check Babinski. Since you have mentioned Babinski, you can ask like, do you know about Babinski? So some of the places where I feel like this might be important, but I just don't want to start explaining it without knowing if it is needed. You can ask. Then you turn the baby and then you check the back. What you are checking is sacral tuft. You're checking for spina bifida and you are checking for sacral dimple. After that, you'll Look at the anus and you look for imperforate anus. Now comes the question, what about all those reflexes of the neonates? Should we do all of them or not? It's quite difficult to finish up to this much within time, by the way, with the two-way discussion, because here only I'm talking and even then it's taking so much time. In the exam, you will have to have a two-way discussion. You will perhaps be interrupted in some places by the medical student. So if that happens, you know that you will not have much time so you need to make that decision about what to include. But if possible, and if you have time, you can at least mention the morose reflex and ventral suspension reflex. And because it can be a bit difficult to explain this to a medical student in the exam, it's better that you practice saying this beforehand. And 
find out how much time it takes. If you are not able to explain this within a few seconds, let's say 20 to 30 seconds, then there is no point in including this. You'll only be wasting your time and you'll not be able to explain yourself that well. If you indicate something, but you are not able to explain, that is not that is not counted as something you did. Because if you simply say Moro's reflex and you do not know what Moro's reflex is or you have not been able to tell why you are checking this, then it doesn't make much sense to do that. So Moro's reflex, if you, I hope you already know about Moro's reflex, but if you want to know, what you do is you hold the baby in supine position and the head is allowed to fall back suddenly. And if there is symmetrical opening of arms before they close, that's what we call positive Moro's reflex. The ventral suspension reflex is you put the baby in a prone position suspended in the air by supporting their hand and back and then baby's head position back and extremities are absorbed if the the i mean sorry chest and the i mean you you hold them by holding them on their chest and abdomen as if they are they are floating on the air and then you check whether they are able to put their head back and extremities in the same line or not if they are not able to do that then that shows the limping or that shows the low tone Yes, Natalia, what is the question? What pathologies we are looking by doing these reflexes? Thank you. We are looking for any neurological developmental abnormalities. So if the baby, baby is, for example, ventral suspension reflex, why are we doing this? Because baby is supposed to keep their head, their back, and their legs on, the, on a somewhat same plane. If they are not able to do that, if the baby is not able to control their head, then we know that there is a neurological problem. But you don't need to go into the details of what neurological problem and what happens after that but at least you should know that it is abnormal you need to know what is normal and if it is not normal that is the second step like what you need to do but because this is only the examination part where we are supposed to elicit the positive signs that's up to that point at least we need to know so this is just a general overview of how to do the neonatal examination in the exam the most, I think the most common challenge in the exam will be finishing this in time because there are so many steps involved. And the second will be communicating it clearly because in many places you will have to frame your sentences and then you will have to clearly articulate them. And if you have not practiced it beforehand, you will not be able to do it in time. My suggestion for examination practice is before doing it with your friends or your study partners, do it alone. Record yourself. Try to speak without any interruption and see if you can finish all examination cases in five to six minutes. If you are able to finish it in five to six minutes, with the added two-way converse conversation, you will be able to finish it within eight minutes as well in the exam. The other thing is, look at the questions and try to decide which systems are involved, what would be some important signs you'll be including in this examination so that you can structure your approach.